The second thing, you went to USC and I went to UCLA, so <laughs> there's a little bit of tension in the room now. <laughs> in the TSA line and the government was shut down and I was making a decision. I was thinking I was going to run for Congress, but I was like, I need some time to think about this. This is a huge undertaking, but I was in line and, um, I left some of my change in the, in the little container where you leave your, you leave your stuff. Okay. And the TSA guard was like, Oh, you left some change. And I just jokingly, jokingly said, uh, Oh, I should grab that. There's probably a recession coming in two or three years. Like I just made a joke. He's like, I'm not even getting paid right now, is what he said. And I stopped and talked to him, and I said, that's really awful. I'm really sorry that they're doing that to you. And at that point, I was like, okay, you know, we need better leadership. Um, and I've always had a motivation to want to run. Uh, so it just, it just really got started um, with that and with my story. I don't know if you've heard about my story about first coming out to California because my mother you Tell had, us more. Tell us yeah, more. my mother had cancer, um, really rare form of cancer. She went to the City of Hope. Uh, she would eventually pass away. And, uh, you know, through that, I, you know, it was some tough times and some, you know, also opened up a lot of opportunity for me, opened up a lot of connections. I was unfortunately living below the poverty line, but, you know, I pulled myself out of it. I own my own small business now, um, information technology and social media consulting business. Um, and then I, um, you know, I'm announcing this campaign. I have information technology background and political economy background from, from my education. Uh, so, you know, I think I'm the only candidate in this race that can really appeal to the younger generation that knows what it's like to struggle through college debt and to be overburdened by those student loans, uh, to understand that we have a system in a lot of ways where um, we're no longer valuing American family values and people worry about raising kids in that kind of system. And then you got an older generation that um, was hit hard by the, by the Great Recession, and they really haven't recovered in a lot of ways. Uh, but we haven't funded Social Security properly. It's severely underfunded. It could potentially bankrupt us even in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, so I can take a message to all of the different groups where I don't know if all the different candidates in this race can necessarily do that. So you said a few things. First off, I'm sorry to hear about your mother. Do you run a small business on IT and social media consulting? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so after the campaign, um, you know, I had to think about what I wanted to do and I always wanted to have my own business and uh, you know, it was motivated from my grandfather. When I was younger, he owned a uh, automotive consultant company. So he would go to dealerships and help them build up dealerships in the back end with the service departments. So I ingrained at me at a young age. I was sitting at my little plastic desk in my grandpa's uh, basement. I'm like, I want to have my own business. And then I kept on trying to run away from IT in a lot of ways. And then op opportunities just kept on coming, coming up. Uh, and then there was a lot of people after the campaign that had seen how I ran my my political campaign, they said, oh, I own a small business, I really need your help. So uh, there's been that, and then we're offering remote support, uh, social media consulting, and, and so a few other things. So that's kind of how my transition into what I'm currently doing kind of came about as well was, I was a top 1% broker in the country, people were really uh, attracted to that, not from the sense that, hey, Jonathan is this top broker, but they were actually kind of surprised that, how do you do all these different things? And everything that you're showing us on social media is actually really not even about houses. It's about your story. It's about the things you like, mm -hmm. the things you don't like. It's about your voice. It's about helping other people. And somehow you're still selling houses and yeah. where is that coming about? And so a lot of the times when I'm talking and I'm actually talking by the time this is out, I've already have talked about it, but I'm telling how to tell your story through social media. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will hear that topic and they'll go, oh, I know it's, you know, you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to do this. But they're just kind of telling themselves what they want to hear. Yeah. And when I talk about this topic, it's never talking from the sense of this is, you're doing this in order to get to business or you're doing this in order to do whatever. It's always, hey, your story is your story. And that's, that's all you're doing. You're just telling it. You're not Googling what to write. You're not, you know, looking up exactly what your competitor's doing and say, hey, we need a, a video exactly like that or our script and our video needs to be the exact same way because that's not your story. And what most people don't realize is 
could they have a phenomenal business by doing all these different things on social media? Yes, but unfortunately, their life is impacted in an uh, unfortunate way because they're living through somebody else's story. They're telling somebody else's story. They're portraying themselves as having phenomenal success and being the top agent and doing all these great things. But in the background, they're putting their family time off. They're not taking a vacation. They're, you know, not showing up to their kid's recital at school because they have to do this. Yeah. Or they're not putting their kid to sleep at 9 p.m. because, you know, oh, I got to prepare for tomorrow. And it's unfortunate. What do you think about the people that are, you know, just what is your advice on people that are just constantly, constantly, constantly just busy, busy <laughs> for the wrong reasons? I think you need to make time for your family. And I think with anything that you do in life that you're really passionate about, you need to make sure that you're prepared and you can envision yourself doing it. And if you haven't envisioned yourself a year or two into something, maybe you shouldn't necessarily pursue it. Uh, family is really important. A lot of my family is spread out uh, throughout uh, you know, the country, really. I grew up in Michigan. Um, so I think it's important to take time for that. You know, I, I'm relatively young. I'm going to be 26 on on Tuesday. Most people tell me that I'm young, so you actually <laughs> beat me. So I'm I'm twenty seven. Yeah. So I'm gonna be twenty six on Tuesday. So I don't I don't have kids yet. So when I'm running for Congress, you know, I, I give huge props to candidates that have to balance that. I don't. I, I think you should have, you know, a responsible outlook on what you're going to try to pursue. Um, you should make time for your family and that's what I've had to really try to balance with you know, I have my own business now. I have a campaign. I do have a full-time job. And uh, that's a lot to manage, right? I work in LA. So that's a, that's, a, that's a lot. That's a big commute. And the one thing that I told myself that throughout all, all this is I'm going to have fun. If I stop having fun, then I shouldn't have been doing it in the first place. So I've just prioritized that from the beginning. Uh, because the money will come with the fun. The success will come with the fun. You'll have some maybe some down times. And sometimes you're like, oh, what am I doing here? Eventually, you'll you'll be successful in some way, shape, or form. So all next week, my phone will be off because I'm taking a vacation. Yeah. And if you were to know a lot about my business, you would go, how the heck could you take next week off? You have so much to do. You're launching this new company. Yeah. You're doing all these other different things. And it just comes back to when I sat back in December in a cabin in the middle of the woods with everything off. I said, what do I want my year to look like next year? And I planned that out. And this week, which is the following week, um, that was the time that I said, hey, this is a phenomenal time. Like, cause I, this would have been done. I would have had this transition, blah, blah, blah. So that was the week that I blocked off. Yeah. And uh, it's never it's never convenient uh, once we get to the week. Cause then you say, oh, I can do this. I have this work to do, blah, blah, blah. But hey, if you thought that that was super important for you, then you have to continue to do that. And, you know, for me to take a week off with my family, I've talked about it before, it's gone viral and multiple times is that, you know, everybody thinks that a realtor can only take a vacation in the winter yeah. uh, because that's when nobody buys or sells a house, right? Which I bought is, my condo in December. <laughs> exactly. So, so which we know is not the case, <laughs> but they, they, you know, school may be out, but who cares about the kids? Cause you know, I can't take time off and, and all these different things, but yeah, I'm taking a, a week off and we have some things planned and other things not planned. And yeah. people will say, well, how could you do that? And I say, how can I not do that? You know, how can I not put my family first? The reason that I'm working so hard is to, you know, enjoy my family and enjoy the things that I like. And then what will happen, I know it will happen is a week will go by. I'll come back. I'll be refreshed. I'll be yeah. energized and I'll work even harder probably, and I'll probably get to somewhere where I didn't even think was going to happen, and that's because I take vacation, and somebody will not be able to grasp their head around that for, for one reason or the other. And I just say, hey, look, if you plan your plan, stick to the plan, and you if you work yourself backwards, hey, you're doing exactly what you said you, you were going to do. One of the things that you mentioned, um, uh, other than you're a, a Trojan, was uh, <laughs> we'll just keep bringing that up throughout. Yeah, we're already getting kicked a little well, bit. One right of the now. things, you, one of the things, that, but you are wearing blue, so I mean, you can't, you can't yeah, really uh, say it's, anything. It's like a you UCLA will never color. see me. I guarantee it. You, you will never see me. You can go through any social media, whatever. You'll never see me in red. Even um, even people that buy me gifts that are in red, my wife goes, "You should probably return that." 
Like that's how much UCLA <laughs> stuff we have Jeez. at our house. Um, anyways, what you said is when running for city council, you ran on a platform where not a lot of people or any people had a specific platform. Could you dive into more on that, what that means for your congressional uh, campaign and your platform and what it is that you're really running for and on? Yeah, because I think I think at at the local level and at the all the other levels, you know, people run on cliches too much. I've I've held this office and you should just elect me again. And, and it's like to do what? And then you di- you dig into their record, and there's a lot of troubling things. Of course, um, at the city council level, we had a really ambi- ambitious pro uh, um, platform. Uh, it was opened by over fifteen thousand voters, and there's about seventy thousand people that will participate in a city council campaign. That's a huge percentage, and you know you don't have emails for all those people. Um, that's a, that's a big number, and we had about what fourteen thousand votes. So you can see where our votes came from. At the congressional level, I'm going to do that same thing. Uh, we're going to talk about issues such as the economy, um, immigration. Uh, you know, we need to save Social Security, like I said. Uh, we're also going to talk us about some more innovative conservative solutions to issues, you know, tax credits to get people out of student loan debt, to motivate people to, to pay back more. Uh, we have to scale back some of the programs because uh, the way our education policy is in terms of federal spending right now is it inflates the cost of tuition constantly. There's a never-ending uh, cycle of inflation, and, and the White House right now is trying to freeze the amount of student loans or cap it, and I'm in support of that. Um, we also need to think about our children and our, and our future. That's part of the reason why my campaign slogan is for our country, for our future. At the local level, it's for the city, for the future. At the at the congressional level, I'm using for the for our country, for our future. And I think we should incentivize people investing in their children. Like that's where our tax code should be should be based around. Uh, so you know, I think we should create a system where you know every parent should expect, or at least be incentivized, to put twenty dollars a week to the side for their kid, not just for college, not for just trade school, but if that kid and that family wants to start a small family business when they're 18 or 20, they'll have the funds in order to do that. Um, so the tax code has to incentivize that. Um, and, and that's a conservative approach. To, you know, Instead of just having universal everything, this is a conservative approach to uh, create small businesses, uh, to avoid you know more student loan debt. Um, so I think about our future, that's that's something that really separates me as a candidate in terms of tax reform. Uh, but then we have to, you know, restore our, our families and, and our fam- American family values. And part of that is making sure that people can, can be successful and that they want to stay in California. We're exporting middle-class Californians every day. And jobs are leaving every day. Uh, so I'm, I'm in favor of extending the local and state t- uh, tax deduction to $50,000. I think uh, right now it's only at ten, and that's just causing a lot of people some pain and grief um, on their tax returns. Um, so I think that's a good idea in terms of uh, you know, getting people you know, the kind of tax relief that they need to, in order to, to not only be successful for themselves and for, you know, they worry about their, fa- their, their parents that are on Social Security, and then sometimes they have, you know, this million-dollar house, but they don't have a lot of cash on hand. So there's a lot of concern with that. But then we have to worry about our children. So that's what I mean by I have a wide range of policies that, um, that I am proposing and um, positions that I'm supporting that I believe will help all our different generations. And that's what we need. We need leaders that will bring everybody together. How long uh, is a typical campaign? How long does that run? It depends. Uh, there's not a lot of people that have announced for Congress. Um, there's a few candidates. So this will be about 11th month run. The city council, I started early, very early to get my name out. And... That was good in a lot of ways, but that was exhausting. Um, we ran for almost two years. That was about two years. Man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a great experience, but by August I was exhausted. And I, I've been very honest about, you know, about that. It's, it was just, it was, it was a lot. That was a long time. And we had really hit our stride right in August, but then I didn't have, I was just burnt out. I didn't have the energy, even at a young age of 23, 24, 25, during most of that campaign to push the rock over the hill. Um, and, and that's really what we needed in that last uh, two months in order to be successful. Uh, but in looking back on it, um, I think this race and the way that I campaign on big ideas, I can, I can have a, a, a bigger impact, bring more people together. Um, and conservatism in California is on the verge of extinction in the next two elections. You know, I'm just being completely honest with people about that. Like, Can you repeat that? 
Conservatism in California is on the verge of extinction in the next two elections. If we don't do something, if we do the status quo, or if we do something worse, we're going to no longer have a, a Republican or a conservative party in California, in my opinion. And a lot of people would share that same uh, sentiment. I just, I just don't think we can continue on this road. Um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a scary time, but we also put ourselves in this position. we got to understand that, I, I, as I tell people, um, vo- voters didn't leave the Republican Party in California. The Republican Party left the voters. Uh, the corporate interests took over the party. Um, really, you know, I, I, I'd say this as respectfully as possible, lackluster candidates um, across the board, um, no unifying message. Like, there's, there's no unifying message for the Republican Party in California. I think the issue with most politicians in general, and actually at UCLA I studied political science, okay. um, but I think just from the perception that most people have on politicians is they'll say whatever it is they need to say to get elected, yeah. but once they're elected, they don't do what they said they would do. Yep. Um, what's the one or two things that if Brian Burley is elected, hey, yes, this is I say I'm going to do this, and these are things that I'm going to do. So then that way... In a few years, I can run that clip and say, hey, look, he said he was going to do it, and yeah. bam. Well, we need tax relief for small businesses and families. I sp- I've spoken about that. Um, we need to crack down on illegal immigration, but do it in the right ways. What is the right way? I think requiring E-Verify is, is a good start. Um, out of all states and all employers, not all states require it. Um, I think that's a good start, and they talked about that a lot. And that takes, you know, it may, it may take bipartisan support, so you have to really package that in a way where you can get, you know, bring people together and understand that uh, you know, this is a difficult issue. You've got people that have come here at different periods of time. Um, some people came here as kids, and they don't know where they came from. Um, I'm not in favor of amnesty, but you know, people should have to pay penalties, and, and we should, you know, they say oh, wait your turn in line. Well, we have to make sure that we're actually creating a, a good line, whatever that line is. You know, what is that process? And we need to look at all that stuff in order to um, ensure that we have an efficient immigration sh- system that we're um, taking taking the best from other countries. Because you know, at, at some point, we are taking you know uh, some of the, the the best and smartest people in other countries that really benefit benefit us. And and that's important because that's our main import is other cultures, right? Um, we are a country of immigration, and we should you know continue to be a country of immigration. But it needs to be legal immigration, not illegal immigration. Because if we don't respect our own laws, then what, what does that say about any of our other laws, right? Um, and then the other thing, like I said, is, is saving, uh, protecting, and, and, and restoring Social Security. Um, with our budget, we're $22 trillion plus at the time of this recording. <laughs> yeah, in debt. And that's only going to continue to get worse. We really need to bu- balance the budget by 2030, um, maintain that only a certain percentage of it is going to be uh, interest payments. Because as your interest payments go up, you can't pay for other things, such as the social uh, services that we're already required to pay for. Like we're, we're, we're legally required to keep those promises, and I think we should. About, um, breaking those promises would be a, a travesty, especially for our older generations and then you know, people that are in their you know, 30s, 40s, and 50s and need to start planning for their retirement as well. So those are the three things, you know, saving Social Security, um, tax relief for our families and our business owners, as well as you know, cracking down on illegal immigration, um, but doing it doing it the right way and, and the most thoughtful way, um, and the way that really does you know, stop illegal immigration. And part of that is securing the border. A lot of people don't like to talk about that, but you know, I, I do support securing the border. That doesn't necessarily mean we need a, a wall f- continuously, because then you'd have to in- imminent domain the whole southern border. And as a conservative, I'm in favor of property rights, and that's a lot of whole lot of government to build a wall across the whole border. But there are some areas where you know, and both sides agree on this, where we need to secure. So you talked about property rights and uh, just flipping the script a little bit and going into housing. What are your thoughts on the current housing market, the real estate market in general, not here just on the local level, but on the national level? I was going to share with you the story about how I bought my condo actually okay. in awesome. uh, what was it, December of 17. Um, I had looked for a while. I was living in a, a studio down in Sunset Beach, and 
I was paying thirteen hundred a month for a couple of years, and that was hard to find. I I looked for that in that market. That's low. That was really low. <laughs> somebody somebody might listen and go thirteen hundred dollars. Where can I find that? You're not gonna find it right now. I no. don't think because right now in that same prop in that same complex they are in the twos. So same same units. Sometimes less. You know they're not as nice than the one yeah. that I was staying in. They had just renovated mine. So I was fortunate, and I had just waited and I pounced on it. So I mean. But I, I wanted to buy, and I was, I was what, 22 at the time, so it wasn't realistic just to be like, oh, I'm going to go buy something. I, at least I didn't think. There's a lot of different, you know, benefits for being a first-time home buyer that I was able to take advantage of, and, um, you know, I'm middle class, so I can, you know, I'm barely middle class <laughs> nowadays, because people are, like I said, the middle class is getting priced out of California, but I was able to eventually purchase a condo, I went into an agentless. Agentless? Yes. Oh, yeah, we're going to have to turn the volume up here. <laughs> Which I don't, I don't <laughs> or, advise. Or maybe we're going to have to turn it down. No, I don't, I don't advise to do it. Um, and let tell, me, me, tell me more about that. And so, firstly, I was in the place I was renting, I had a lease that was supposed to go another year, and we had just renewed a month into the lease. Um, they were going to raise it to 1350 They said, oh, we want to sell. Then they start bringing people in while I'm living there. And that's so inconvenient. Like, that's just is like, a, it's like coming in on your territory. It feels like they don't give you any, like, they're supposed to give you a heads up, but they don't always give you a great heads up. Um, and I kind of made it difficult for them, too, because I'm like, I don't want to move. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, honestly, I made it a, like, I, you know, I have rights. And I, I looked up my rights online, and as I encourage anyone else to do, be respectful, don't, you know, don't impede on that. But... Um, that place sold by for way more than I was willing to, to, uh, to buy. And that was in the summer of 17. So I didn't buy until December and I bought for 52,000 less. So I played my cards right. And I got something that was, I had to put a couple grand in, but it was first floor, just as nice. It worked out. Uh, the agentless process was interesting. So I went into this and knowing that like where I was, where I was pre-qualified and like, I had been talking loosely with an agent and I had told her, I said, can you get this deal done? Like, you know, this is, I know you need to take a cut and you know, this is, I'm like, cause if you don't, then I'm going to go by myself. Cause I've done enough, like I've done a lot of reading on this. Like I'm going to go and I'm just going to make an offer. So I am walking around the complex and there's one right, like next building over. And I see the sign, I go knock on the door. I'm like, I need to make an offer on this. And like they didn't even know about it. Yeah, I hadn't heard. So if they would have came to me sooner, I would have probably still gone through them. So I, I talked to her. I said, I need to buy a place. I want to buy a place in here. Like, it's my goal. Who's but, her? Uh, the, the, uh, not, the not the name, agent. but the, got it, got it. An agent, agent, an agent. Sorry. Her is an agent. Got yeah. It. And I um, went over there, and I'm like, I'll make an offer. But I, and I, I'm supposed to have my own agent, yada, yada, yada. I got to make sure, you know, there's not a lot of wiggle room between what I'm pre-qualified for and what you – want but I was like it was like five grand more they wanted five grand more than what I was pre-qualified for so I'm like if I don't go agent then I will save that commission and then I can maybe I can maybe make it work yeah, <laughs> yeah <right. laughs> so the the agent the agent that I was supposed to work with called that was a me. joke that's why I yeah. played that <laughs> <laughs> well anyways that agent that um that I was supposed to work with, I, I asked her, I said, can you make this deal? And I didn't get reassurance. And they had called me like five days after I had already spoken to the people I in the in the unit that was for sale. So I was like, you guys are already kind of, you know, dropping the ball here. It feels like I need to get going. And they have a lot of different, you know, clients, and I was respectful of that. They were great people. But I just was like, I, I need to get a place. I was like, when you want something and you're hungry for it, you have to you have to go after it, right? So I said, all right, I will make an offer. I'll go through you. And then I signed a agent agreement with her agent. And she, of course, <laughs> yes. But she's always going to have the seller's interest at hand is the thought, right? Um, or that's usually what people think. Um, so let me cut you off. Yeah. So you started agentless. Then you knocked on a door. You spoke with somebody, you eventually spoke with the listing agent, and then you went to make an offer, or you made an offer, you made an offer with what agent? I made an offer with the seller's agent. With the listing agent, okay. And, and now, she was really great. And now we're picking it back up, okay. Yeah, and she, you know, she explained how she's going to represent both of us, but I knew 
you know, that, of course, you know, they want the biggest sale, right? I mean, that's, that's what I would want. Okay. And that's just kind of common sense. Things started to come back where there was, um, you know, we had to get the, the place evaluated, and there was a few things where I, I was in the position to negotiate a lower price. And I really, like, negotiated a lower price. You negotiated the price? Well, yeah, she said, how much you want to offer? Oh, and got it, I, got it, I got sent it. it to her. That's me negotiating. And first they rejected, and then I almost backed out. And then tax reform was happening. And I didn't know as a first-time home buyer if my all the stuff I was eligible for, if that was going to cease to exist you know, come 2018. And also the market was just continuing to go up, and I was going to get priced out. And honestly, there hasn't been – I probably have <sighs> – at least eighty grand to one hundred grand in equity in that place relatively quickly, and I haven't put maybe four grand, five grand into it. So I bought at a good price. You know, I, I consider you know I negotiated and I almost backed out. Like I said, like no, no deal. I played hardball, and then I called her back at like midnight because tax reform is coming in like fifteen days, and I'm like, all right, I'll do this. I want this off much off closing costs. Let's make a deal, and then. uh by like 10 a.m. the next morning. We had to like make sure everything didn't get canceled with escrow because I had already said deals off. And uh, next morning, 10 a.m., they said, all right, they'll take the deal. I had negotiated at that point. I had negotiated about off the original purchase price, probably about almost 30K. So I was pretty happy with that. So what's the, what's the advice there as far as going agentless or using a realtor to help you in the transaction, pros and cons? Yeah, I think... Uh, you say whatever you want. We don't care. Everybody, everything on here, I mean, <laughs> yeah. if you say, hey, I don't, don't advise, do it. Unless you're like you have the time and you're a single young man in his 20s that can do some research, like how I had to do on my property rights. How much time did that take you? I don't know, man. It was a lot. So a lot. Okay. <laughs> so um, unless you have a lot of time. A lot of going. time. Because even when you go to signing some of the stuff, like you're just signing, you know, when you're signing your loan papers, like people get to a point where they're just signing, right? That's just that's just the truth of it. Like you're just signing your life away. So if feel. you so go agentless if you have a lot of time, and you're gonna and you're sign willing, anything, you're, you're and risking, you don't have you're you risking don't, stuff too. You're right? risking yeah. what you're signing because you don't know exactly what you're signing or well, exactly how that a, infects you. I had already been a part of a uh, trying to buy my condo on the second floor, which was the next building. I had already been through the process before. So I did already have some experience of like working with, you know, kind of loosely with an agent and I kind of seen where the market was going. So I, you know, that was just my situation, you know, being a single income 20, what was I 23 when I bought it? I think, yeah, it was, that was what I had to. So if somebody do. says, Hey Brian, I heard your story on Jonathan's podcast. Originally you said that you were going to go agentless, but at the end of it, you ended up working with an agent yeah. What's that yeah. one one piece of advice? I'm a 23 year old something and was in your exact same shoes. Yeah. Um, do you think that I should try to go the agentless route or I should hire somebody to represent me? Not just for the mere fact that if they're representing me as a buyer, then technically I'm not paying anything to them and I'm getting a lot of things. But what's what's your advice on that? I think who you deal with has to be your number one. Concern. And that's why our slogan is who you hire truly matters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think that was, you know, I felt comfortable with working with the seller's agent. Um, and I was super skeptical at first. I, mean, I, I really like was, I would just be like kind of blunt, be like, come on, like you want the highest sale. Like, no, like, you know, you're, I want to make sure, you know, you're young and not a lot of young people get to buy. And, you know, I'm, I've been blessed by God to have all these opportunities to run for office, start my own business, to own a condo, be a young homeowner at this age. And I'm really grateful for it all. But yeah, I had to, I had to do my research and I had to, to save. I had to, you know, make some tough decisions. Um, and I'm, I'm proud that I did it. And I own something and, and I always wanted to own something here and it was my dream. So when I was able to do that, when I wasn't expecting, I thought I was gonna have to wait until I was like 30 or something, <laughs> wait until I get married. Now I have this piece of property that's worth something that, you know, I can run out and maybe make some money in a couple of years or sell it or whatever I want to do with it. Um, but yeah, my advice would be to not do it or to, you know, 
go into the actual negotiations when someone has a contract with you with someone that's willing to sit down and explain it with you like the seller's agent was and um she was a great person she gave me a home depot gift card for christmas because right around christmas after it all ended and i went and i i was ripping apart they had, they had carpet in this place a carpet in a place by the beach when the Ooh. hot tub is like two buildings over I'm like we gotta get rid of this we got it we gotta do a lot of work in here um but we did at a good price you know and uh there's still stuff i have to do with it because you know it's, that's just because it's life and it's life. <laughs> you live in things <laughs> and then you notice things and whatnot yeah. i'm just looking at my uh our messages that we were messaging back and forth just to see what we were talking about or not talking about one of the things that you said is, uh, I like what you're doing with social media. It'd be great to get any of your input. Do you, a lot, you want to elaborate on that question? Well, Maybe had, there's something I, I could do. I see what you're doing, and I guys. also I do a lot of that um, as well with social media. You know, it's always good just to have a little bit of a meeting of the minds with that stuff because this stuff is so new that even people that have grown up with it, they're learning something new every day, right? People seem to think that, like, you know, Maybe you or maybe I are supposed to know everything about social media. And I'll be honest, like, I don't know everything about social media. I know more than maybe the average person, but, yeah, I don't. There's still a lot to learn. So, you know, just to have, you know, bounce stuff off, off you know, off your brain and, and vice versa. I think that's a, a good benefit to have. And, um, and anyone watching can, of course, do that. They can reach out, too. And, and you know, I, I have my business, and we do that for, for businesses and for individuals if they want to. But um, that's not... Um, you know, that's not my number one priority. It's, you know, if someone wants some just general advice, I'll, of course, give it to them. And I think you're the same way. I see stuff with your with your uh, social media about, like, you know, you just have to have your phone to get started, but and, and anyone can do it. And, and that's true to a, a large extent, right? And then there's some gaps in, you know, people's knowledge. And that's why I started my business, because there was a huge gap in, like, some of these um, business owners' mindsets on how, how to even, you know, they don't even know where to get started. And... Yeah, and and the people that, that are reaching out to you, what are, what are they asking for as far as, because I know I, I a lot of people reach out to us as well. Um, a lot of realtors reach out to us as well. But for business owners that are reaching out and you're saying, hey, they don't even know to get started. Like, what are they saying? Hey, this is what my goal is. Because for us, it's usually they tell us what their goal is. Or excuse me, they tell us they want to get started. But then I say, well, what's your goal or what's your intent? Oh, hey, I want to run an ad. Well, what's who are, who's that? Who do you want to see your ad? Oh, well, I don't know. So I've, I've just said, like, hey, that's a bad idea if it's a bad idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's not always, like, uh, like the best approach, depending on who you're trying to talk to. Some people want to always hear yes, but I'm going to be honest. Be like, that's not a good idea. Um, I've talked to people with companies, but I want to be in front of the camera, and I want to promote my business. I'm like, well, you have a very niche market, and you're going to have to, you know, target these these people. And I don't know if it's going to be worth the couple dollars a day even that you're, you're, that you're going to spend on an ad. And, you know, you have organic growth, too, so you can take that into account. But it's still hard to, to get sales just off the Internet in general. Like, it's, it's not an easy thing. So people ask just to grow their business. They want help with their website or with their uh, email marketing or with um, you know, Facebook or you know, Google Ads. And, um, you know, I can, I can get people in the right direction. I can get them, you know, show them how to you know, track stuff with the Facebook pixel or do Google Analytics. But um, I do want to train them. and you know, try to pass some of that knowledge on because, um, you know, people pay something to me as, you know, as a business owner and I don't want them, you know, while we will, you know, be there to upkeep things if we have to, I would, you know, it would be preferred for them and, and for us to a degree because, you know, that shows that we were successful for them to learn and then, you know, take the ropes and, and do it themselves. So, yeah, sometimes it's like an ad and, you know, video ads are the thing now because they, they get more more exposure, but you got to make sure that, you have a market for that. You know, some people have to just make, you know, call their leads nonstop. That's still like calling is still very, uh, a very successful approach. Um, and, you know, sometimes you have to go door to door. And uh, you do that with campaigning too. And, and that's, you know, there's a different approach for every business. There's a different approach for every campaign. There's a different approach for every sector for that matter. Um, so, you know, with, with my business and I've tried to kind of approach things differently depending on the situation and give people as pure as of advice as possible because you know i think that's important do you have any specific questions for me in something that maybe you've seen us do or talk about that hmm. could help 
you in your business? Well, I think I think one thing. I don't know. Are you? Do you do Twitter? I have a Twitter. I don't know what do you do Twitter you do means. Twitter? <laughs> I've never nobody's I've ever asked me. Do you do Twitter? Those youngins saying, do they do their Twitter? <laughs> do you do the tweets? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a Twitter. Most of the stuff that goes like on my Twitter is just from Facebook that goes onto Twitter. We do schedule out posts and we have a f- fairly organized calendar of yeah. when content goes out on which platforms and whatnot, because I am a huge proponent on if, and, and in this is for any business, if all your eggs are on one specific basket or on one specific platform and that thing goes out then you're kind of screwed so actually about a couple weeks ago instagram and facebook went out for about 36 hours and everybody's like in a panic um life is kind of nice it it was actually kind of (laughs) peaceful for a second the good thing about that is is you know if they already know your story they already know what you stand for they already firmly believe who you are then then you're good to go but if they didn't know that and these platforms go away then you're just the, the the same person as the one right there. You know, yeah. I always say if you're going into a listing presentation or you're talking with a buyer or whatnot, and they don't know 90% of what you stand for and who you are and whatnot, then they don't trust you. And if they're going into a meeting, like with their guard up, like, okay, can I trust this person? Like you guys are not going to have the same conversation as going into somebody that goes, Hey, you know, good to finally meet you. I feel like I've known you for like a, you know, a year I've been following you on X, Y, Z and you know, how's your son and what are you doing? And blah, blah, blah. Relatable. And so, you know, anytime you go into a presentation, you, you already have the upper hand and then you can talk about the things that are you know, pertaining to them. Okay. what are your goals? What are your, you know, what's your story? You know, everybody, of course, they're going to say the, Oh, we need to sell this house for the highest price. Or, you know, we want to buy this house for the lowest price. Well, you know, tell me more about that. You know, what, what are you you using with the the money that you're getting back? Um, Oh, you know, we're actually, we're going to try and reinvest it and do X, Y, Z. Okay. Well, if I can help you do this, that leads to this, that blah, 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 uh, in, uh, you know, leads to your ultimate goal. Uh, is there anything in my presentation that, you know, you would think wouldn't help you? Well, no, like I want this. And you said that you can make this happen. Then, you know, why, why are we still talking about whether or not we want to work together as opposed to somebody going in, unfortunately, with a mindset of this person's got 200 grand in equity. If I were, I know they're going to sell their house. I got to get it. I need a paycheck. I need to do this with my paycheck. Yeah. And then, you know what, then I can, I'm just going to kill it on social media because I'm going to have so much money and I'm going to do all these things. And then and meanwhile, this person is sitting there like they have no clue who you are. So I think that's why when it comes to social media, it is get, getting back to do you do the Twitter. It is, it is, <laughs> it is, uh, well, I, I guess something to, I, I wondered if you did it because I feel like it's kind of dying. Like Twitter is like slowly but surely dying. And I just, don't, I'm, I'm not existent on it. I just haven't like really I think prioritized that, it at all. I think for certain businesses, it's good. I think on actually for politicians, it is really good. And that's one of the I'm most like, I need to popular get on there. Twitter accounts is a politician, and yeah. I think for politicians and athletes, those are like the two people that you always see on, on Twitter t- using Twitter and using their 140 characters and to, to Twitter and uh, doing more. But no, we don't do it that much. <laughs> uh, we're Predominantly on Instagram and Facebook, our YouTube, we're trying to get to where we want it to be. There's a huge change coming f- soon with Facebook. So uh, there's uh, messenger bots and AI and all these things yeah. are like the talk of the town. Like any week. startup talks about artificial intelligence and neuro linguistic programming and all these cool fancy words. But to really understand, unfortunately, they don't. But Insta or Facebook, who owns Instagram came out and said, we're going to combine the messenger platform between Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp into a singular platform. So that way we can take more advantage of messenger bots. So we can take more advantage of uh, interactions between uh, most people. The reason why Facebook changed their algorithms because they felt that the engagement and the interactions with people was lost because they weren't seeing their friends post because they were seeing whoever's post or whatnot. So that's huge because WhatsApp outside of the U.S., it's the number one uh, platform 
uh, even us as agents here in the U.S., a lot of the communication that we have with foreign buyers is through WhatsApp. And when they reach out to us, they always say, what's your WhatsApp number? Like that's just second nature to them. So to have a singular platform for Messenger, I think it's that's probably going to be the, one of the biggest things that's going to be coming out. I got a message from a bot earlier this week. I, I don't normally get them in my normal Messenger. Sometimes in my business stuff, it'll come through. And I, like it was like on Monday, and I'm like, no. And then they came back on uh, yesterday. And then it went from a no to a stop. I'm like, and then uh, you want to unsubscribe? I, I actually unsubscribe in my own message. Like, so the way that that works is, so with yeah. Facebook, if you think about it, it's the same thing. If I were to ask you, delete your, do you delete your text messages? What would you say? Yes. You delete your text messages? I do, yeah. Oh, so you'd be one of the few <laughs> who actually go and actually delete all their conversations. Yeah, because it gets kind of hectic. Otherwise, so yeah. you're one of the few. Do you delete every email that goes into your inbox? No. So with Facebook Messenger, what they don't realize is that somebody will put it out an ad or whatnot to get you into Messenger. Once you're into Messenger, it's basically the same thing as if they got into your Gmail or whatnot. Yep. They send you a message, you either reply or you don't reply, whatever, but they're still in your Messenger. That's how the bot is able to then re-engage with you or see actually, I don't know if it's unfortunate or not, but they can see the the different types of communications you're having with different pages and and whatnot and then they can they can send you a new message or they can try and get you onto their newsletter yeah. or they can do all these different things and the reason that they can do that is because you still have an open communication with that bot because you haven't deleted it from your messenger platform and that's kind of how the There's message a lot of data thing. going around behind the scenes and tons of it yeah and so for a, a politician that's running ads and whatnot there's tons of different things that you would have to change about your current platforms in order to get approved because we've heard about the issues with politicians running specific ads and last targeting was, demographics. It changed and, last year. Even. Yeah. And you, there's you get disclaimers. And yeah. Well, that. if you go on right now, it's going to ask you like, Hey, are you a politician running ads? You have to, you know, get approved to do yep. X, Y, Z. Have you messed with that, any of I that? I did stuff? that last year. When, okay. Um, Cause we started, uh, launching ads before the disclaimer requirements and that was before Zuckerberg was had his whole hearing and it was simple then you just hit boost and put your campaign card in or campaign bank account information in and, and you roll this now and you had to send in like they sent you something via mail you had to go on your I don't remember what it was you had to go on your Facebook authorizations type in a code then you had to take a picture of your license send that to them and then you had to wait like 10 days so it wasn't something like Politicians can't just get up and running um, right away. They just can't unless they have some crazy connection with Facebook. Maybe I, I, I can't imagine, you know, they have the infrastructure, even customer service when I try to get a hold of them where they, they have like a way to expedite that. So it was a little bit, you know, when I, it happened right before 4th of July for me last year, 4th of July, you have a ton of Huntington Beach people on Facebook. So I'm like, this is the time. And I got it to activate on July 3rd. And I was like, it was stressful because I'm like, this is like, you know, you're missing a lot of exposure. Um, because everybody's on there. You know, they're posting fireworks. They're posting, you know, things at the parade. And, yeah, so it's gotten a lot more complicated. And I think, you know, you know running for Congress, if you, I don't know if you ever watched that hearing with Zuckerberg, but where they were asking questions. Our leaders were literally asking, how does Facebook make money? Yeah, and we run We run ads. ads. And you're like, what do you mean you run <laughs> ads? It's like... <laughs> Like, I don't mean it, like, in a mean way, but, like, it's, you know, you have to do your research before you go into these things. Like, that's just something so obvious. Like, if you were to have a uh, oil company executive come in, like, well, how do you, how does your company make money? <laughs> like, uh, like, really? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and they act so astonished. And I, I think we have to have leadership that at least does their research on something basic like that. But, you know, people are running Facebook ads all the time, and you can get out there for as little as a dollar a day. Um, but, yeah, they've changed it up on how you have to, you know, get authorized to post as a candidate, which is good because of all the stuff that happened in the 2016 election. People were worried about, you know, anyone can run an ad at any time and you can influence an election. And I, I see that concern, and I think they took some steps that were necessary. Um, and, yeah, it's just a little bit more tedious on, on our end, but it's worth it for, for the public. Wrapping this up, the majority of people listening are in the real estate industry, whether that be a realtor, a mortgage lender, somebody that has some ties to real estate, which I guess everybody kind of does. But 
specifically to real estate, is there any piece of advice that you would give somebody that's wanting to, what we say, create a business in life that they love? So, you know, through my experience in the story, I explained to you about buying my condo. I think relationships are really important, but also just laying out everything on the table. So my lender just told me, hey, this is this is what you're looking at for payment. This is how much you can. Um, this is about how much I, I think you can afford. Didn't run my credit right away. He just ran my bare numbers. I had already had a recent credit report. Sometimes people are like, I won't talk to you until you I run your credit. And it's like, that's so messed up. Because like this person, like I had so many people that I ran my credit once with one person and they didn't know all the stuff I, applied, I, I was eligible for. And my second one did. I'm like, you just ran my credit, which is my livelihood, right? And that, that upset me. So relationships are important, and that's also important with, you know, selecting your agent. And like I said, I don't advise going agentless. Um, that was just my situation. I really didn't go agentless when you, when you think about it. Like, long term, I took a little break from having an agent, and that was because I just needed to find the place and, and go into it. But um, for that short period of time where I was agentless, it was a little scary. I didn't know what was gonna <laughs> what was gonna happen, but it all worked out for the the best, and I'm I'm grateful and and yeah, I'm really thankful for and thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Um, and you know it's gonna be an interesting eleven months. Uh, I think we can get the word out and, and make a difference, and that's what this is all about. Sweet. Well, usually the way that we uh, end is with music, and we like to see whatever your first reaction is, and then and follow me on. Uh, it'll be Burley for Congress. I was going to say before we oh, before okay. we end, where can people find you? Where can people learn more about not just you, but your platform? It, it'll be Burley for Congress are my usernames. Um, and you can find my personal Facebook where we do a lot of uh, a lot of our campaign stuff as well. That is for F-O-R or? It's a four as in the number four. The so number Burley four. Burley for Congress. And a website? BrianBurley.com. And if they have any questions, they can reach out directly to you. Yep. Um, campaign emails, campaign at brianbrilli.com. Um, there's information on our website. has my story on there, has our platform, has forms you can fill out to ask questions. So uh, that will all be up and live. Um, when we're recording this I'm, we're the day before the announcement, <laughs> but it'll all be up and live starting tomorrow. Anything else that you want to say? Just remember to vote for Brian Burley for Congress on March 3rd next year. Help us get the word out. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. And uh, God bless everybody. Sweet. Hey, everybody, this is Jonathan Hawkins. Thank you so much for staying until the very end of this podcast. I definitely appreciate it. As always, make sure to reach out to me via social media at Jonathan Hawkins Official. Send me a comment, shoot me a DM. If you have any questions, you can also comment below. Thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe below. And remember, who you hire truly matters.